You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Sick of those trivia podcasts that you don't even understand how to operate and they just have too many levers and buttons? There's got to be a better way. Now there is with Good Job Brain, an offbeat quiz show and trivia podcast that makes learning new things easy and fun. I just learned that artificial vanilla flavoring sometimes comes from the anal glands of a beaver, and now I can never shake that mental image. Thanks, Good Job Brain. Good Job Brain is available for the low price of just four easy payments of free. It's a podcast. Good Job Brain is part of Airwave Media and available on all podcast apps. Operators are standing by. Curious about the nuts and bolts of the stock market? It's not just for finance types anymore. Take it from a couple of regular guys, Dave and Andrew, who taught themselves about investing and teach it all on the Investing for Beginners podcast. Start with their Back to Basics series on episode 43 and use that knowledge to design your better financial future today. The transition from President Donald Trump to President Joe Biden stands as one of the most dangerous periods in American history. But as number one internationally best-selling author Bob Woodward and acclaimed reporter Robert Costa now reveal for the first time, it was far more than just a domestic political crisis. Woodward and Costa interviewed more than 200 people at the center of the turmoil, resulting in more than 6,000 pages of transcripts and a spellbinding and definitive portrait of a nation on the brink in their new book, Peril. Today they come on the show to discuss the candid moment when Donald Trump all but admitted that he had lost the 2020 election, how Rudy Giuliani convinced Trump to then contest the results, and why leaders in Trump's own party determined that the case was completely meritless. They talk about the other vice president who influenced Mike Pence's decision to certify the 2020 election for Biden against Trump's wishes, and the moment when Pence actually considered invoking the 25th Amendment against President Trump. They also reveal the two times when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, had to assure his Chinese counterpart that Donald Trump was not about to launch an imminent attack, and the lessons to be drawn from those exchanges as America attempts to navigate an even tenser relationship with China today. Plus, will Trump run in 2024? A crash course in the Bob Woodward School of Journalism and finding the operational commander behind the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Coming up with Bob Woodward and Robert Costa in just a moment. Woodward is an associate editor at the Washington Post, where he's worked for 50 years. He has shared in two Pulitzer Prizes, one for his Watergate coverage and the other for coverage of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He has authored 20 national best-selling books, 14 of which have been number one New York Times bestsellers. Robert Costa is a national political reporter at the Washington Post, where he's worked since 2014. He previously served as moderator and managing editor of Washington Week on PBS and as a political analyst for NBC News and MSNBC News. Now they're out with a new book covering the madness that ensued during and after the 2020 election in their new book, Peril. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you. I mean, there's so many stunning revelations that came out in this book and so many just interesting and revealing scenes, particularly about Donald Trump, but also about Joe Biden. In particular, I think of one scene in this book where Keith Kellogg goes to Trump alone in his private dining room at the White House. And Trump is just sitting there watching television, watching the insurrection on January 6th. Kellogg is trying to convince Trump to post a tweet asking the crowd to stand down at the Capitol. And he just sits there watching TV. It really has a sense of Nero fiddling as Rome burned, doesn't it? Well, I mean, this is Trump's passivity about the insurrection, but his intense, endless activism about uh, making sure that he makes the, the, the effort to sell this unsupported claim of the stolen election. What 
we found we had this nine months divorced from the Washington Post to really focus on this book. And the reporting shows very clearly that there was a hidden national security crisis in all of this, that the consequences of that may be war with China, maybe some sort of military action, even use of nuclear weapons. This is on a zero to 10 scale, a scale of really a 15 or a 16. And that's what I think really surprised Bob Costa and myself. Well, Bob, let me ask you this, since you brought it up. There is this well-reported moment now where General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, calls his counterpart in China, General Li, to assuage his fears about Trump potentially launching some type of an American attack on China. In fact, this call takes place twice in this book. It wasn't an isolated incident. One of those moments did take place on January 8th, immediately following the events of January 6th, I sort of feel like the headline has run away with the story. And it's been painted as Milley was worried that Trump might launch an attack and certainly expressed some concerns. But my understanding is more that he was less, at least in the conversation with General Lee, that he was less worried about Trump launching an actual attack than about China misinterpreting kind of the toxic combination of Trump's bluster and movements, military exercise going on in the Pacific as some type of an imminent attack. Is that accurate? I think that's completely accurate. What do you think, Robert? Milley was clearly responding to a crisis. And the only thing I would add is that the book shows how General Milley was, over time, growing increasingly alarmed. And the period that really matters in the book is the period in late May through January 6 and the insurrection. You see in late May... General Milley starts to see President Trump unravel with the George Floyd protests. He battles his military advisors, both civilian and non-civilian, over the use of the Insurrection Act. You see Trump trying to bring the 82nd Airborne into Washington. Ultimately, they stay at Andrews Air Force Base, a fact in the book that probably deserves more attention about how close a military confrontation came in the summer of 2020. And This story snowballs with the reporting as the book goes on, and it really takes a reader through Milley's experience and the experience of others like Gina Haspel, the CIA director, a nonpartisan figure, Secretary Esper at the Pentagon, as they watch at times with alarm, even horror, about this president and his conduct, screaming at them, ultimately firing the Secretary of Defense, which led Director Haspel to privately confide to Millie based on our reporting that she feared a possible right-wing coup. And then in November, later in November, the president, outside of the usual channels, the, the normal channels, has a directive, a memo he signs to withdraw troops from Afghanistan and Somalia. All of these were red flags for Millie about where Trump was going, how he was using the levers of power. And what you see is in the story of in January 6th, 7th, and 8th, especially January 8th, is Millie is in a culminating moment, making a decision to bring in members of the NMCC, the Pentagon's war room, the National Military Command Center, to underscore the procedures for using nuclear weapons or having a military strike. And it doesn't come out of nowhere. The book shows it comes out of all of this experience and his his troubled assessment about where this could go. Yeah, there's a chilling phrase in this book that he uses, quote, the darkest moment of theoretical possibility. I kind of love that phrase, Uh, not, not in a good way, but it really sums up the moment there. It really does. And that phrase captures this idea of his assessment of what his responsibility is, that he's chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the number one military man, but Trump has fired November 9th, the Secretary of Defense, and installed Christopher Miller, someone who will do Trump's bidding. And Milley's very suspicious of this. Um, The person who's the most suspicious is Nancy Pelosi, who two days after the insurrection, and we have a transcript of this call. And it's one of the most remarkable things I have ever seen, because Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, somebody in political combat with Trump, 
but also as Speaker is second in line for the presidency, knows the procedures for using nuclear weapons. And she calls Milley and says, look, you know, what guarantee can we give that Trump will not just order a strike? And she says, he's crazy. And Milley says, I agree with you 100%. In sworn testimony a couple of weeks ago, Milley confirmed all of this. He certainly did not deny that he acknowledged that Trump was crazy and agreed 100% with her. And he, he added something that is not in the transcript that he's not qualified to judge the mental condition of the president of the United States, which is exactly true. He's not, none of us are really, but he has to look at what is that? I mean, you use that phrase, what is the darkest thing that can happen that's theoretical in a way, but it's not theoretical for Millie because As Nancy Pelosi says, I can't call the acting secretary of defense. He's been installed by Trump. You're the one, General Milley, I'm calling and I'm saying, I want you to give me a guarantee. Milley says, well, we have procedures. And then he realizes that there's a weakness in the system. And this weakness really ought to be examined. The real peril is. We have a system where the president is commander in chief, can all by himself decide to order military action or the use of nuclear weapons. So I've done this for 50 years, as you mentioned, one of the most dramatic scenes. Milley calls in the war room of the Pentagon, the people who are on watch 24 7 to take orders from the White House or the commander in chief. And he says, our procedures call for me, Chairman Milley, to be involved. I want a personal oath, essentially, from each of you that will you will make sure I am a participant in any order for military action or the use of nuclear weapons. And he goes around the room, got it. Yes, sir. Got it. Yes, sir. Got it. Yes, sir. I mean, this is somebody acting easy to protect the country from that darkest possibility. And it does say volumes that General Milley felt the need to call his counterpart in China and reassure him that there was not an imminent attack. And there's an interesting moment in that conversation where he says, if the U.S. is going to attack, you and I will be having a conversation. There will be red flags. There will be talking. And I wonder, are there lessons to be drawn from that conversation as President Biden now navigates an even more fraught relationship with China over Taiwan? What you see with the, with the General Lee relationship is something that has echoes in history, that during the Cold War, the Soviet military leaders and U.S. military leaders would often have back-channel discussions to try to de-escalate situations. And more reporting needs to be done on what's happening now. But our book shows that Milley treasures, on, in a professional sense, the ability to have these kind of conversations, whether it's October 30th, 2020, or January 8th, 2021, with General Lee. And the book shows how what happens in the United States does not happen in a vacuum. There are national security and foreign policy consequences for domestic political events and domestic crises. But it also shows that so much of national security policy can often be driven by human relations, that not everything in national security and foreign policy is a transactional chess game. Of course, those dynamics play into everything on that front. But our book shows in scene after scene how it's Milley taking the initiative to have a human relation with an adversary as a a way to make sure that a catastrophe does not happen. And this is a five-year relationship, really, literally a top secret back channel. And as we know now, we hadn't confirmed this for the book, 
Milley had the permission and informed his superiors in the Pentagon and the White House what he was doing here. But it's like working with Costa on this book, I discovered that Costa has some golden relationships with longtime sources that were essential to our reporting. And it's not you know, that I could call up someone and say, okay, tell me what's really going on. This is the kind of, as Costa says, treasured relationship that Milley had with the head of the Chinese military. And as you you said, there are two calls, but the first call is before the election. And this is the worry that China thinks we are going to attack them. And the whole conversation is designed to de-escalate. And Milley says to him, look, General, it won't be a surprise if we're going to have some sort of military action. There will be a buildup. And then he says, invoking that five-year relationship, this is not one of those times. We are not going to have a fight. And General Lee then says, I'm going to take you at your word. Now, you can see the history of war is often a history of miscommunication. World War I, supposedly no one wanted World War I. Everyone built for it. And the assassination in uh, Sarajevo of the Archduke was the triggering mechanism. No one would have predicted this. This led to a war that killed 50 million people. So you are in that seat that Milley, where he worked day by day with the Chinese, with Trump, and Trump just, I mean, it's astonishing the scenes that we depict in the Oval Office. I mean, it's irrational screaming. It's if you were somebody participating in this, you would say, as a lot of people, say this Trump is in mental decline. Speaker Pelosi, he's crazy. Right. Billy saying, I agree 100%. Well, I want to talk about that because there are some interesting moments in here where Speaker Pelosi is having that conversation with General Milley about invoking the 25th Amendment. There's one point in here where Chuck Schumer and Pelosi are trying to get a hold of Mike Pence to speak to him about invoking the 25th, and Vice President Pence won't take the call. It's interesting because publicly, Pence snuffed any talk of removing the president, but I was fascinated to read and hear that the vice president actually did ask his staff to look into the feasibility of invoking the 25th after the Capitol riots. Can you tell us more about that, Robert? This is a very important scene because this is after the insurrection, the day after. And Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer, based on our reporting, say we got to call Pence together and force him to consider the 25th Amendment to invoke it. And so they call him together. And Pence does not pick up the phone. The two Democratic leaders in Congress are put on hold by the vice president of the United States. And while Pence puts them on hold, he talks to his lawyers and his advisors, including Greg Jacob, his counsel. Jacob is a little known lawyer, but Jacob makes the case legally to Pence that because in his view, Trump is not mentally or physically incapacitated, that the 25th Amendment does not apply in this specific situation. Pence accepts that argument, but they deliberate for at least 15 minutes, because we know in our reporting that Pelosi and Schumer are kept on hold for about 20 minutes. And finally, Mark Short gets on the phone. He's Pence's chief of staff with one of the other aides and says, Pence won't be coming to the phone. And so the call never happens. And part of this was about keeping Pence away from even having the discussion with these leaders. To even turn them down would be having the discussion. So Pence wanted to avoid that politically. But the thing you rightly pointed out is our book reveals there was a legal discussion at some level, quickly dismissed. But this is an important juncture because if Pence considers the 25th Amendment, maybe Pelosi and Schumer do not pursue impeachment, but ultimately they quickly pursue impeachment for a second time because Pence does not want to participate on the 25th Amendment. And it's a historical moment of what if, and we take you behind the scenes to really take you there in the day after. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And some of the moments in here between Trump and Pence, where Trump is saying, wouldn't it be 
quote unquote cool if you had the power to overturn the election results and screaming at him, we're not friends anymore, are, are kind of shocking. What did you learn, Bob, about the Trump Pence relationship while you were writing this book? Well, it needs to be tracked from the beginning. And of course, uh, as Vice President Pence was always willing and subservient to Trump. And you see, as you track the history of Pence having to deal with his responsibility as president of the Senate spelled out in the Constitution and law, he has to essentially count the votes to certify who's going to be the next president. And the numbers show that it's Joe Biden. And Pence is dancing here. He's riding both horses. He's looking for a way to accommodate Trump. And there is this extraordinary call between Pence and former Vice President Dan Quayle. They're the two people from Indiana, Republicans, who'd been vice president. And Quayle, after he lost the the vice presidency and Bush Sr. lost the presidency, he had to, as president of the Senate, get before the Congress and certify the votes, which he did. And so there is this talk between Pence and Quayle, and, and Pence is looking for, gee, maybe there's something I can do. And Quayle because he's traveled this road, reads the Constitution to uh, Pence and the law and says, there's no wiggle room. You can't do it. Drop it. Drop it. And again, Pence is, as Robert was saying, he has the discussion, long discussions with lawyers, with political advisors. He's looking for a way. And to his credit, he decided that the law and the Constitution would have to hold, and he defied Trump. And of course, then Trump has staked essentially his whole post-presidency. I mean, think of this. And we have scene after scene of this, and some of it's public, where Trump is out there saying, the election was stolen. What I'm going to do, I'm going to run again in 2024. And how does he put it, Robert? I mean, it's then I'll be elected for the third time. Is that what he finally says? That's exactly right. I mean, it, we're really looking at a, a Republican Party that's still dealing with these dynamics across the board. President Trump just refuses to concede, and his voters are still with him. Uh, and there, are, there is polling out there that shows the Republican Party may want to, in some corners, go in a different direction. But as we show in our book, it's going to be very hard for them to tangle with him because the fervency of his supporters is so strong. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with more when we return in just a minute. I'm Brian Keating, host of the Into the Impossible podcast and the Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics at UC San Diego, where I study the origin and evolution of the universe. I believe scientists are obligated to explain our work in simple terms to non-experts, the people who fund our fascinating research. So I created the free university you can attend in your pajamas, taught by the world's brightest faculty. Best of all, you won't incur a dime of student loan debt and there's no homework to complete. Every week, I put out a deep dive interview with important thinkers and authors like Andy Weir, Steven Pinker, and Michio Kaku. I've talked to nine Nobel Prize winners like Sir Roger Penrose and Frank Wilczek, and talked to a few astronauts, including Commander Chris Hadfield of Major Tom fame and Dr. Jessica Meyer, live from the International Space Station. I'm on a mission to magnify curiosity, stoke imagination, and inspire minds of all ages. Join me. Because the only way to discover the limits of the possible is to go beyond them, into the impossible. Welcome to the Wild Black Podcast, a safe space designed by us and especially for us. Wild Black is here for all the moments. The times you want to scream, we get it. So we'll scream right along with you. The times you just need someone to say it plain and make it make sense. So we bring on expert guests who care enough to do just that. 
the moment you need to laugh. Why does grandma have plastic on the couch? And who are these people that put sugar in their grits? Not me. Wild Black has you covered. In the moments where you need inspiration or motivation, our dope quote leans against words from our past to inform our future. Wild Black is here to help you, entertain you, inform you, inspire you, and simply make you better. Wild Black is freedom. Do yourself a favor and ride with us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Now go hit that play button. Well, I have to ask then, do you think that Trump is going to run again? And will it be, as Trump campaign manager Brad Parscall suggests in this book, purely for revenge, quote? I think the question about whether Trump will run again is the the obvious answer is not the answer. It's not about yes or no, whether he runs again. It's about if he runs again, what would that look like? What would it mean for American democracy? And one of the big undercurrents of this book is the fate of American democracy being tested by a national security crisis, a domestic political crisis at the same time. And if he runs again, will respect for the democratic system be front and center or not? And if not, could we have a system in place in 2024, and we're already seeing movement afoot in different states, a system where alternate slates of electors are hoisted upon Congress at the 11th hour to change the direction of a presidential election, to change the direction of the whole count in the Electoral College. That was avoided this time, but our book shows this John Eastman memo by a conservative lawyer was working to try to get Pence to consider alternate slates of electors, which we show in the book did not exist. But the real question is not whether Trump runs again or not, but if he runs or someone like him runs, will the system hold? And also, if if I may, what would the stakes be Trump running even another Trump presidency? And again, look to what we found in our reporting. This There's this extraordinary moment It's November 11th, so it's just eight days after the election, and Milley's up in the Secretary of Defense's office, the acting Secretary of Defense, Chris Miller, and this memo is shown to Milley, signed by Trump, saying, withdraw uh, all troops from Afghanistan and Somalia. And it's clearly Trump's signature. Milley said, what the hell is this? And everyone denies that they saw this. And Milley goes and gets his formal uniform on and goes over with the acting secretary of defense and his chief of staff, uh, this very shadowy figure, Kesh Patel. And they literally barge in to the office of the National Security Advisor. So these are the last days of the Trump presidency and the security advisor is Robert O'Brien. And Milley just booms out, what the F is this? And O'Brien hasn't seen it. No one else has seen it. And O'Brien to his, it's a you know, wait a minute, we can't just have the president going rogue and signing orders like this with the entire national security apparatus cut out, including the national security advisor, including the acting secretary of defense, including the chairman of the joint chiefs. So O'Brien takes it to Trump and says, you just can't do this. You know, by law, we have to have a process where we include these key national security figures. And Trump agrees to nullify and withdraw the memo. O'Brien comes back to Milley and says, OK, it's withdrawn. And Milley accepts that. But here's the evidence that two underlings got Trump to sign this. And how the government the national security apparatus is not functioning. And so alarm bells are going off everywhere, not just by Milley, but General Kellogg, who's in the room during this interchange, and Robert O'Brien, somebody who was a a Trump backer, somebody who was as alarmed as anybody about this. So you live in that world. You know, we all live 
in the world of our experience. You can't have that experience and not say, my God, we've got to go to general quarters. My God, we've got to do everything to protect a system where the president, as we know, as commander in chief, has a concentration of power that people really don't understand. He can call. And that's what Milley realizes. This is what Robert O'Brien realizes. He can sign something like that. And he has that constitutional power. So they have to put some sort of process and enforce some sense of discipline. And there's no, of course, this is the Trump that is in this book and the other books that have been done. This is the Trump of no discipline. This is the Trump of I will do anything to preserve my political position. And so when you sort through all of this, I think lots of people, including General Milley, including Robert O'Brien, including anyone who touched this system, they're kind of, oh, at least Trump's gone. At least Trump is not in the White House. He does not have the power of the presidency, but he's there as a political 800 pound gorilla. And, you know, as as Robert says, what's going to be the outcome? How does Trump run? How does Trump use this? And so people in our business, not for any partisan reason or anything other than this is the story of the age. Will somebody come back and run and become president again. Go back to Nixon when he resigned in 1974. He he conducted a war against history and did, did all kinds of things, but he never tried to run again. And we now, we are living in that moment. Right. But he probably never tried to run again because he didn't have the backing of the Republican Party. He clearly had tons of pushback from his own party, whereas Trump, it's less so. You know, we've talked a lot about the handful of people who who acted as guardrails, General Milley, and to some extent, Pence. Bill Barr actually also features prominently in this book. But I want to talk about, in addition to John Eastman, some of the other figures who were kind of his work worst enablers, particularly Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani. It sounds almost like Bush had accepted defeat in the days immediately following the election. And these two kind of came in and whipped him up and came to him with all kinds of quote unquote evidence (laughs) of election fraud that they then presented to Senator Lindsey Graham and Senator Mike Lee, who were, of course, Trump allies. Tell us a little about the quote unquote, again, evidence that Giuliani and Powell offered up and what Graham and Lee's reaction was to that. Well, it's clear that some of the Republicans who are around the president may have wished that it was President Bush, but it was President Trump, uh, who in the days after the election tells Kellyanne Conway privately, how did we lose to this guy? So there's a private acknowledgement that he had lost to Biden. But by the time Giuliani re-enters Trump's inner circle around November 5th, 6th, 7th, the president starts to change his tune. Trump starts to say it was stolen. And people like Sidney Powell, this conservative lawyer on the outside, feed him conspiracy theories about election machines being rigged, which Barr and others say is total hogwash. It's not backed up by any fact or any evidence. Uh, But the president stews and Trump just keeps collecting these people around him. And there's a meeting in the Oval Office in December. We paint a vivid picture of Sidney Powell almost becoming a special counsel to the president in the White House or even at the Department of Justice. But like so much of this story, She doesn't ultimately get the job because of animus of Giuliani. Giuliani wants to be seen solely as Trump's lawyer. He doesn't like the competition from Sidney Powell. So ultimately that's skirted. But it's not just Giuliani and Sidney Powell. One of the revelations in our book is the story of Steve Bannon, who had been on the outs with Trump for years, but quietly re-enters the fray and starts telling the president in private phone calls, you must focus on the six. That's the day you should have a reckoning. Kill the Biden presidency in the crib. Pull Pence off the effing ski slopes. 
And now Bannon has been subpoenaed by the January 6th committee in the House of Representatives. He has so far resisted engaging with the committee. President Trump has told Bannon and others like Dan Scavino, who we show was in the Oval Office with Trump on January 5th, to not cooperate. Trump is citing executive privilege, trying to assert executive privilege, even though he's out of office. This is an ongoing legal and political battle. We are all tracking. But the broader point here is that while Barr and others were trying to be guardrails, Barr ultimately resigns in December. Someone like Secretary Esper is fired. And what you see is the formal guardrails, those with official positions on Capitol Hill included, like McCarthy and McConnell, are pushed away by Trump. He turns to other voices, Giuliani, Powell, Bannon, Scavino, unelected advisors, unelected officials, some on the outside, some on the inside, to help him and to fight. And he he cannot give up the idea that he lost. And it comes back to a chapter early in the book. To me, as a reporter, you really trace back this behavior. And Bob Woodward and I are not psychiatrists, but Paul Ryan, the House Speaker, when Trump selected, studies handbooks on narcissistic personality disorder, where someone with that disorder, Ryan concludes, after reading these articles, cannot accept public humiliation. And whether Trump has it or not is not for us to diagnose, but clearly the president at the end is doing everything to avoid public humiliation, even if it tests the strength and continuation of the American democratic system and a peaceful transfer of power. And since you mentioned the January 6th committee, they continue to investigate the Capitol insurrection, but we still have yet to find, I guess what you would call a smoking gun or some kind of an indication that the insurrection was planned. So to sort of go back to the Watergate playbook, Bob, do you think that there has to have been some kind of operational coordinator at the helm of this? This, I think, is exactly the right question. If you look at Watergate, it was Howard Hunt and Gordon Liddy who were the operational coordinators for the Nixon White House, the Nixon campaign in 72. And that now is history. And if you remove Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt, it's very hard. Somebody had to actually do conduct the operations, the break ins, the, you know, they went and I mean, broke into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to get dirt on Ellsberg. Unimaginable acts. Again, as Robert and I worked through this, the, the national security aspect is so important to understand. And that period, the days after the election, when Trump finally, oh, it was stolen, it was stolen. And as we Recalled, he he fires Secretary of Defense Esper and Secretary of State Pompeo, who was really close to Trump and an ally, starts saying, "Uh uh-oh, the crazies are taking over. And he confides that Trump is in a dark place. And the CIA director, Gina Haspel, then says, you know, we're worried about a right-wing coup. And Then on November 12th, Trump has a meeting, National Security Council meeting on Iran, and they're going through this. And my God, Trump sees something to people. Oh, maybe we'll strike Iran. And the military people are trying to tell him, you know, you start striking a country like Iran, you may wind up with a war. And Gina Haspel, this person steeped in evaluating power in foreign governments, evaluates what's going on with Trump. And she said, my God, we're going to attack Iran. We're going to lash out for his ego. And Pompeo finally says, and he'd been in favor of some sort of action against Iran, and finally says at, at the end, November 12th, look, I don't want to talk. Let's leave Iran to the next administration. I don't want to talk about effing Iran ever again. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's truly, truly remarkable what comes out in this book. And Robert, I have to ask, you know, I've heard you speak in other interviews about sort of getting the crash course in the Bob Woodward School of Investigative Reporting, which it really kind of sounds like it was kind of going back to the old school ways as opposed to texting questions to sources and that kind of thing. Tell us a little about that. Bob Woodward and I, having done it, I've done it just recently at the Washington Post, have such respect for daily print reporters, because as a daily print reporter at a place like the Washington Post, you are under pressure by 5 or 6 p.m. at night to hit the deadline with a 900 to 1300 word story that's deeply reported as much as possible. Woodward's method is for these books, which are nonfiction, original reporting, is to keep going back And that, to me, was the joy of working with Bob and that we could, instead of chasing the ball of where the news would go, we could chase the story that had happened and dig and dig and ask further questions, ask for more documents, do interviews, study transcripts. We ultimately ended up with 6,000, more than 6,000 pages of interview transcripts. And what it leads you to as a reporter is a fuller, richer picture of what happened because you have what Woodward calls, rightly, the luxury of time. And there is something about going back and asking people who are directly involved to reflect, share original documents, that you're able to get a better understanding and that the insights come from the addition of more reporting. And Woodward is a master at not being satisfied with one or two people's version of events, but trying to always understand different perspectives and to build as much as possible. And not to speak for him, but I know he is guided so much by his his mentor, the late Ben Bradley, who edited the Washington Post for decades, who always would speak to Woodward and other reporters about getting as close to the truth as possible, to get what Bradley called the most obtainable version of the truth. And that has remained his ethos, his guiding light. And for this project, it was our guiding light as well. What is the most obtainable version of the truth? And you learn the value of extended interviews. Robert did some interviews. There's one interview he did for eight hours. Now, in daily journalism, you don't have the luxury of doing that. But not only just an eight-hour interview, but then going back to that source again and again and merging accounts, finding out what happened, not just from one person, but people keep notes, people have It's astonishing the record that is out there. And, you know, this is something you can get close to by going back and back and back. And uh, we're particularly now at this moment hoping that the January 6th commission in the House can do an exhaustive look at not just the insurrection. uh, And that is the key. But the key is about Donald Trump. What don't we know about Donald Trump? And looking at the national security end, I think is essential. I think it's very important to revisit the whole issue of how Trump handled the COVID-19. And there is a record there And we are now at this moment where 700,000 people in this country died and some real hard, serious questions need to be asked about that because that tragedy is going to go down in history. And, you know, hopefully it will subside sometime in some way, but let's not run by what was a catastrophe for the United States. I agree. Well, you know, I feel like I've kind of given short shrift to Joe Biden, who also features heavily in this book. Perhaps that's a conversation for another time. The book is just fascinating. Again, it's called Peril. Order it on Amazon or wherever you get books, folks. Bob Woodward and Robert Costa, thanks so much for talking with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again to Bob Woodward and Robert Costa for coming on the show. Order their new book, Peril, on Amazon, Audible, or wherever books are sold. 
and follow them on Twitter at at RealBobWoodward and at Costa Reports. If you enjoyed today's episode, then subscribe and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Detailed reviews are the best way for new listeners to discover the show. Follow us on Facebook at at Kickass News Pod and email me with your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at kickassnews.com. Kickass News is a part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com and check out some of our other shows like Food with Mark Bittman, Movie Therapy, Investing for Beginners, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, and many others. For now, though, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass News. An Airwave Media Podcast.